um, ethical teachings that, as we've explained, are to enhance our lives, not with the letter of the law, but beyond the letter of the law. How can we strive to live a life that isn't merely doing what you're obliged to do, what your duties are? Now, we have duties and we, got, we have to fulfill duties in life. Six, for Jewish people, 613 commandments. Uh, for um, non-Jews, seven universal laws of uh, mankind. Those are duties. But what we're learning here in the ethical teachings of Pirkei Avot, of Avais, is beyond the letter of the law, which we need to appreciate and to understand. So we are, uh, yesterday we had an introduction. We're going to do, today to begin with the first Mishnah. Um, we have people here on Zoom. We have people on Facebook and we have people on Clubhouse with us that are joining. So Clubhouse, we can hear you uh, on Facebook. Um, you can hear us on Zoom, though you can hear and see the advantages of Zoom. Anybody wants to come on Zoom, 770-770-6085 is the Zoom address, and we'll let you in with pleasure. But if you want to stay on the medium that you're in, on, by all means. Okay, let us get to the, oops, the first Mishnah. Okay. Here it is. All right. So the first Mishnah says as follows. Moshe Kibbal Teirah Misinai. Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, he received the Torah from Sinai. And he passed it on to Joshua. Uh, and Joshua, he passed it on to the elders. The elders that are called Zikinim in Hebrew and to the prophets, the Nevi'im, and from the prophets, it was from the elders giving to the prophets, and the prophet passed it on to the men of the great assembly, and they said three things. Um, what they said was, and we're going to get to that shortly, but before we even get to what they said, uh, we need to appreciate just this very, the, this phrase that we just learned that Moses received the Torah from Sinai, passed it on to Joshua. Joshua to the elders, the elders to the prophets, the prophets passed it on to the men of the great assembly. Why is this important for us to know the assembly line of how things were passed on? Why do we need to know that? That's a, a one question. Um, in Hebrew, the word kibel means to receive, masara means to pass on. Um, those are key words that I want to uh, emphasize and I want to explain. What, what does that mean? What is the concept of to receiving? What does it mean to receive? How do you receive? What does it mean to pass something on and how do you pass it on? And, um, and as I mentioned, why is this important? So the Bartanura explains over here that this is giving us the tradition on how it was passed down, ethical teachings. In other words, there are, um, oh, look at that. I think Marcy's coming to join us on Zoom from uh, Clubhouse. <laughs> That's amazing, very nice. So there are 60 tractates of the Mishnah. 59 of them are about do's and don'ts. Those do's and don'ts, we understand that that comes from Sinai. Like, you know, this week's Torah portion, don't eat the pig because it only has, you know, um, uh, it has split hooves, but doesn't chew its gut. You know, you know what a pig is? It puts out its, its, its hoof and says, look at me, I'm kosher. <laughs> because what you can see of the pig is kosher, right? Um, because it has split hooves, but it doesn't chew its gut. So um, understanding that what the, the concept of why it's not good, I mean, that's just an aside, of course. Point being that there are the do's and don'ts in Judaism. And that comes from Sinai. But the ethical teachings, the human aspect of how to behave, is that coming from Sinai? Or is that just like, you know, 
Viktor Frankl's Men's Search for Meaning or um, any other uh, great psychologist or self-help book that is out there that gives us insight into human nature. It gives us uh, hopefully uh, inspiration that we can lead a better life, but it's all based on human knowledge. So the beginning of the ethics of our fathers comes and tells us, no, 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 no. Moses received this from Sinai. It's coming from God. And then he passed it on from generation to generation in order that we should have a clear idea that these are not just human ethical teachings. I mean, they're for humans, of course, but they are based on the divine. That is, uh, as the Bartonura and other commentators explain. But I'd like to, uh, to go a bit further into this idea. There are five levels here of what it means to receive and to pass down. What does it mean to be a recipient of something? Kibel, to receive. And what does it mean that you give something over that you pass it on? But before that, I have a question. If anybody can uh, answer this question, I'd appreciate it. Well, uh, I shouldn't say that there's an necessarily an answer. This is my thought, my idea. If you were to reduce Judaism into one word, what would that one word be for you? Anybody care to share? Vilma, Sina, Franklin, Celesti. I don't know if I pronounced your name right. I'm sorry if I didn't. Jennifer, um, Riva, Katie. Go ahead, Vilma. Partnership. Sorry? I say partnership. What was that? Partnership. Partnership. Ooh, that's good. <laughs> that is really good. Um, that's good. Sina, what would you say? Hi, uh, I was just going to say truth. Truth. Okay. Can't argue that. Can't argue either one what you said. Anybody here on Zoom want to share? Marcy, what would you say? Or uh, Liba, anybody else? Life. Life. Okay. Very good. Excellent. So let me see. Anybody else has something to share over here on this thought? Um, love. Love. All right, Reggie. I can't argue that. That's really good, too. Um, maybe laws or commandments or something? Laws, commandments. Okay, great. So you know what I would say? Okay, thank you, Katie. That was really good. Actually, all of you answered something very good. Um, I would say Judaism as a, um, if you want to call it as a faith, a religion, or whatever you want to call it, a lifestyle, whatever term you want to use. Uh, uh, the term, that, the one word I would say is tradition. Tradition. And why, what, what, the word tradition. What does it mean, tradition? In Hebrew, it would be Mesorah. Mesorah is something that you pass down, that you give over. Judaism is about giving it over, whether it's to your children, whether it's to your community, whether it's to another. It's about passing something down. You've been given something. You now you know, pay it forward. You now carry it forward. So it's interesting that the words over here are Moshe Kibel, he received. So to pass something on, like a baton in a relay race. I don't know, maybe I say this because when I was a kid, I used to I, I, I used to run fast, short distance only. <laughs> and I used to be in relay races <laughs> and passing on the baton. I could picture it you know, many years ago. So you have to know how to receive the baton in order that you can now give it over to the next, right? So there's about being a recipient, Kabbalah, Kibel, and then passing it on. And perhaps that, that's what it's saying over here. There are five steps over here and what it means to be a recipient of actually divine wisdom, because that's what this is. This is Moses received from Sinai, which says, by the way, question, why does it say he received from God? Why does it say from Sinai? Because there are five steps and what it means to be a proper recipient of divine wisdom 
that you could now actually pass it on and give it over. You know, many people, they learn and they learn, but maybe they don't, I don't mean retain the knowledge as much as imbue the knowledge of Judaism, that it becomes a part of them. That when it becomes a part of them, then, then they have it, it's theirs and they can give it over and, or, or share it. I don't mean give it over like giving a class I'm giving now. I mean, that's one way, of course, but in a way that you live it in such a manner that you, by extension, you're passing it on. And there's five levels in that. The first one is Moshe and Sinai. What does Moshe and Sinai represent? Sinai, you know, there's a famous Medrash. I'm sure many people have heard of it before, that before the Torah was to be given, at, uh, was given on Mount Sinai, uh, many mountains debated amongst themselves who is worthy of giving the uh, or the Torah being given on them. Now, you might ask a question, how can mountains uh, debate? Um, <laughs> You know that uh, the birds, the birds, birds communicate, and if we had the knowledge and what birds were saying, then we would understand their communication. But you know, not only birds communicate; all, I, everything in this world is a communication. You know why? Because it's God's word that is animating it, and if it's God's word that's animating it, therefore there is a communication that is being messaged from all created beings now <laughs> i don't know what they are at all don't get me wrong not that i know what the birds tweeting you know besides twitter uh i don't know what they're saying um and there's a beautiful story about that maybe we'll tell another time but we got to be careful to uh, sometimes get some knowledge that might be far ahead and beyond us that we might not be good to have but the fact is that since it's the word of God that's animating, it is the language uh, of uh, the Hebrew letters that is the animating force. So there is a, a communication. What is that communication? Again, I don't perceive it, but the wisdom of Torah is telling us is this debate between the between the mountains. So the you know the the, the tallest mountain said, well, it should be on me. The widest mountain said it on me, and little Sinai was very small, and said. I'm small, I'm nothing unique and, and great. And God said, you know what? The humility of Sinai, we're going to give it the Torah on that mountain. And indeed, who is Moses himself? Moshe Rabbeinu is the humblest person on, in, uh, in, in, uh, from the entire generations as God testifies in the book of Numbers, speaking about his great humility. So the first thing, in order to be a recipient of any divine wisdom, or for that matter, to be able to receive anything from anybody, and all the more so something that's you know divine, um, we need humility. And what does humility mean? Humility doesn't mean that you think yourself as um, nothing, or that you are you know. It just means you don't think of yourself. You're always thinking of your purpose. You're always thinking of another. You're always. It's not about me. It's about something greater than me. That's ultimately what, uh, in, in brief, what humility, I mean, there's much more to humility than that, but in brief, that is the concept of that it's not about me. As long as everything re, uh, begins and ends about me, um, I can't receive anything from anybody else because all I'm going to receive from them is something that is about me. So much less will I be able to receive from God infinite wisdom from his teachings, his ethical teachings. I'm just going to take it and warp it the way that kind of sits with me and suits me and, you know, is comforting to me and the way I want to take it. And obviously, then not only you don't receive, but then you don't really have much to pass on. That's the first point. Any questions on that? Any comments? Any uh, thoughts on that? I got a thought. Go for it, Katie. I have to unmute un un myself. There. Um, I thought that in order to receive, you have to make yourself parallel and that that's in the word itself because the first time it was um, mentioned in the Hebrew Bible was like in the Mishnah with the poles, the hoops that held the poles. Uh, um, uh, that held the... You're 
I'm not certain what the reference I'm is. The word, key, but the word Kibel. Are you talking about the word Kibel? Which, by the way, the word Kabbalah, which, you know, mis Jewish mysticism is a reference to because Kabbalah is a tradition that was received. Um, that was received. So yeah, I don't know enough Hebrew. I That's the word. Yeah, the root word for that. Right. Okay. You'll find it and you'll bring it to me another time. Okay. Because I'm not certain the reference. But so the, the first thing is to be able to make ourselves a recipient. And that is humility. The way we receive is by kind of emptying me, myself out that I have room to receive. If I'm full of myself, obviously there's no room to receive any wisdom, anything of another, let alone divine infinite wisdom. That's the first thing. The next thing is it was passed down to Joshua. So now it's given over, the baton is passed forward and Joshua represents, well, it's interesting, you know, Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu wanted his children to be his heirs and to be the leaders of the Jewish people. But God said, no, it's gonna be Joshua. Does anybody know why? Anybody know why Joshua was chosen? Why wasn't it um, Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu's children? Okay. So the reason is because, oh, Davida, you wanted to say? I don't hear you. If you're speaking, I see your. your Here, use mine. Oh. Oh, okay. So, um, I just want to say because um, Joshua was Moshe's um, student, so it kind of um, transferred into Joshua. Whereas right. um, I think that Moshe's children, um, along the line down further, there would not be righteous um, um, ancestors from them. So the first part, uh, uh, the first part is correct. I don't know about the right uh, down the line. I'm not, that I don't recall seeing that. But the first part of that, um, he was a student, but not just uh, any old student. It says Lo ayel. He was so diligent. He was so devoted. He never parted from the tent of learning. He rise early, stay late, in the study hall. So the first thing you need is humility in order to receive. The second thing that you need is the diligence in your engagement. You can have humility, but then, you know, and, and which is interesting, humility is sort of like breathe, to breathing in and sort of, um, you know, you're, you're making space, so therefore there's less room, you know, there's more room for another. Diligence is about you, um, uh, so to speak, engaging, devotion, you're, you're engaged. So it's an opposite movement, which is a paradox, but that's all truths come in paradox. So the second thing is this diligence is the devotion, right? Um, in order to acquire divine wisdom. The third thing is Zikanim, the elders. So the Talmud tells us who is an elder. The Talmud tells me, someone who acquires wisdom. So the, the term that's used is acquiring wisdom, owning wisdom. So you can have humility that makes space. Diligence is, and devotion is engagement, but then engagement needs a third element and that is acquisition, owning. In other words, diligence then will allow you that whatever you are learning, whatever you're um, engaged in, it becomes filtered through you. Because diligence is to the subject at hand. Devotion is to the subject at hand. Acquiring is now taking it and making it mine. Right? Owning it. Owning what you're learning, um, internalizing it. So humility first, 
right? That's the basis. Discipline and, and engagement, devotion, second. Owning it is the third element. Making it mine. Now, what does it mean to make it mine? Anybody can has has a thought on that? Well, when you make something yours, it becomes a part of you, deeply ingrained, where you're acting upon it because it's it becomes a part of your speech, of your thoughts. It's whatever it is is a part of you. Very good. All right. It becomes. Um, remember the two words. Kibel, Masruha, receive and give over or pass it on, right? The baton, take the, 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 the metaphor of the baton, right? Of the relay race. So you have to receive it. And then in order for you to pass it on, you have to pass on something that's yours. So you have to own it in such a way that you can give it to another, that it's going to be um, uh, genuine. And well, how is it genuine? If I can just parrot what I was taught, because I have a great memory, that's not owning something. That's a parrot. And that's, you know, that's a level, that's devotion, that's engagement, but I'm parroting. When I can put into my own words, and that's why, by the way, every day in Tanya, and probably we should do it here too, um, I, we always end off, I know now that. And the reason why I ask of you to do that is because you own then what you've just learned, because now you've got to say it in your own words. You know, if you were just to copy and paste the, <laughs> from the text what it said, uh, not exactly the point. Right. Well, you might be engaged, but you're definitely not. Um, you're not um, owning it. So the third element, in order to receive, in order then you can pass it on, that you have a tradition, that you have something, is owning it. That's the idea of the elders, right? Then there's after the elders is the Nevim, the prophets. Um, so. The prophets, interesting, you know, for someone to have prophetic vision, um, what they need to do, I, I, I'm only telling you what's written because I have no idea from any experience because I don't have prophetic vision. <laughs> right? um, I have to clear my glasses so I can see sometimes, you know, let alone prophetic vision. Um, so, the, the idea over here is um, it's another step in the part of acquiring. In acquirement, that, it's, that it makes it ours, we have to let go of something to let something else in. Now, we have that with the general idea of humility, but now with the prophets, this goes another step. It takes it a, a, another deeper level. So prophets, before they could prophesy, they, they, would, they would kind of like, uh, what's the right word? They kind of shed the externalities of their being. And again, what that means, I don't know. Can't tell you from any experience. It's like, you know, any, anything that's extraneous to something that's core essential, you know, like, you know, the pandemic has actually taught us something interesting that you know, core essentials is what we need in our lives, extraneous um, secondary things in our lives, we've shed throughout the pandemic. It's just a way of metaphor, right? Um, so the prophet needs to shed all the extraneous things um, of, in, in, in order to be able to get to core, in order to be able to have prophetic vision. So the same thing is, if you want to be a true, you know, recipient, a, a, a true um, recipient and, and be able then to give something over, we need to be able to shed extraneous things that, that can impede 
in our receiving and giving. So like, I, I, you know, today there's so many extraneous things in our lives, right? So many things that are vying for our attention. You know, it used to be 200 years ago when you lived in a shtetl, you know, um, you know, a cat that went across the, the, the town, uh, the town um, street was, oh, you saw there, there was, you know, you saw, remember that cat with the uh, piercing uh, eyes? You know, that was like a big news. <laughs> Today, we're, we're so bombarded with so many images, so many information, so much that we, we don't receive any of it, at least not consciously, maybe subconsciously, because it's just we're a bombardment. We have to get rid of the extraneous things, focus in on the essential. And when it comes to any kind of wisdom, any kind of connection to another human being even, right? This is all, all about receiving and, 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 and passing it on, whatever it is, a connection, a, 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 um, a wisdom, a teachings. So that is the fourth element of what the prophets represent and what they are. And then the fifth element and the final element is the men of the great assembly. They were 120 uh, individuals that their job that started was headed by Ezra the scribe um, in the beginning of the second holy temple in the fifth or the sixth, no, no, fifth century before the common era. And their duty or their job, their engagement was um to um their engagement was to make sure that all of the needs of uh all of the needs of the community were taken care of whatever challenges to fortify jewish life that was their responsibility that was their engagement they were to bring back the glory that was in the first holy temple and, you know, and to bring all that back into the second holy temple. And that represents the idea of making it practical. Now you've received something it needs to have a practical application. Theirs was to bring into practice the application of living Jewish life to the fullest. That's what their, their mandate was to bring Jewish life to the fullest in the Jewish community. Um, that was their mandate. So what does that mean in our idea of being a recipient and being able to pass it on? You gotta then come to something concrete and practical for you to receive and to give over. If it's just a nice warm feeling, that's not sufficient. If it's just a, uh, I just like, you know, just, uh, I don't know what, uh, what the word is, um, just to tantalize the soul and to feel, ah, ah, that is just so beautiful for the soul and you feel the, the warmth, that's what's sufficient. If you want to be a recipient of, of a divine wisdom, in the bottom line, yeah, we have the four, five levels, you need to make it into something concrete and real that will bear fruit in some manner. That's the first point that I want to bring in. That's the idea of tradition. <laughs> That's the idea of what the tradition is, how we can carry on the tradition to receive it and to be a part of the process of passing it on to the next generation, to others, and so on. Any questions or comments on this part before we go further? Paul. Rabbi Neshikos, this is Paul. Hi, Paul. Uh, I'm brand new to Clubhouse and I'm learning iPhone, so apologies if my profile is not up. But two things come to mind that you were talking about. And again, Yashikov. Thank you. The first you were talking about extraneous and the other was talking about how do we make it ourselves. Uh, with extraneous, I was thinking we're just out of Pesach when the concept of chametz is so profound. And with making it our own, I think back to uh, to the Amim Noraim and Labrit Habet is all about so many examples of how you know Hashem is like a, a potter who has mm. the, the clay on the wheel, but what is made from it is unique, and how we make it ourselves, and examples like that. Beautiful. 
Wow, thank you. Anything more to add to that? Very nice. Yes. Hey, Rabbi. Oh. Yes, Katie. Go ahead, Katie. I found the thing that I was referencing earlier. Um, Can we get in, back to that at the end? Because uh, it'll it'll take us off uh, off the road right now. Which you know, I'm more I'm more than happy to deal with it. But if we can deal with it later, okay. Okay, okay. I already know the answer. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> great. So we'll we'll get there. Otherwise, the, I I don't want to lose the uh, the flow in the moment. Uh, anybody else to sh question or to share something? Now, Paul, that was great. Okay, so. So now they said three things. Let's get into the three things. Imagine before they said anything, we already had a teaching. Before they uh, taught anything, we have a teaching. Now you might ask them, well, what do you mean? the men of the great assembly, they, they said three things. Well, uh, you know, what, did they have a, uh, a tiny zebra? Did, uh, <laughs> did, they, did they not communicate more than three things? So the Bartonur explains, of course, they communicated and taught so many different things. They had many teachings, but these were the three formidable things, the three things that stand out, the three dictums that uh, you know are sort of be, to be said, to be said in their name, to perpetuate you know the ethical teachings of Judaism. So, what are the three things? How the misunim bedin, you should be patient in judgment. That means to tell me them hard bay raise many disciples, have many students. The associate with Torah, and you should make a protective fence for the Torah. So I have some questions here, but before I ask my questions, does anybody have questions on these three statements that were made? Uh, again, this is sort of what we're going to remember: these great individuals, men of the great assembly. Uh, from the times of Ezra, they were actually lasted for uh, you know a few centuries in their duties until uh, the, uh, they came into the Sanhedrin. In any case, so again, be patient in judgment, raise many disciples, and make a protective fence for the Torah. Anybody? Um, any questions on this? Okay, so I'm going to ask my questions. First of all, what's the connection between the three things? Patient in judgment, many disciples, protective fence. This seems to be like, you know, no relationship between them. It seems to be just, you know, um, a one-off here and a one-off there. And, you know, nice. Not, you know, can't argue with it, but there must be some kind of relationship. Furthermore, well, seems, go ahead. Sorry, Vilma. It seems like a community building effort. Uh, okay. Okay. Well, um, very good. Okay. So, furthermore, it says hemidu in Hebrew, hemidu means to raise up. So it's an unusual language to raise, you know, to lift up many students. And what's the exactingness in many students? Um, we need to understand that. So let us explain. And furthermore, be patient in judgment. Who is that talking to exactly? Is that talking to me? Who? Or to all of us? <laughs> so let's, um, let's see some of the commentators over here. So um, the first thing to be uh, careful in judgment is speaking to judges. Now that makes sense. Judgment, judgment in a court of law, one needs to be patient. What does that mean? Very simple. We all have first impressions and many, and very often we lead in judgment based on first impression and you know, game is over. So for a judge in a court, that would be terrible. So, of course, be careful in judgment. Um, furthermore, not only that, but imagine if you were a judge and you had a similar case just a week ago, almost identical the case. So you're going to be also rash in your judgment. 
because hey, I heard it, and you're going to listen with a half a ear. You're not going to have key bell. You're not going to have the receiving, the hearing, the, you know, the arguments in order to make an appropriate judgment. That's something that um, uh, that the Bartanura explains and the Rambam, the, this explanation. Another is that it's speaking to leaders. In other words, um, what is it saying to a leader? A leader should not be, should not rush to make a judgment harshly. You know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about um, much, and uh, I don't want to digress on this uh, really too much, but, uh, you know, leadership and politics on how with the pandemic, the harshness of uh, the things that are being said, and maybe it needs to be said, and, and you know, when, the, the scare tactics, maybe it needs, maybe not. I'm not certain. I'm, you know, I'm debating it uh, inside of me. <laughs> you know? But uh, leaders should be sure when it comes to at least uh, to individuals, be careful on your rushing to judgment harshly. Got to be patient and to take into consideration the conditions that a person is dealing with. And good leaders um good leaders want to make sure that they perpetuate the tradition the torah knowledge the torah observance to make sure tradition is passed down as i mentioned before that's the one word that i would sum up Ju judaism right that's what i would but you know um i'd use other words and for other aspects but you know for judaism um so um in um in 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 that in that notion a good leader wants to make sure that you're perpetuating the future for the future generations well when you're going to be harsh with people you're going to turn them away so you got to you got to be able to be sensitive to the shortcomings um and um be able to see beyond that and see where those shortcomings are coming from and the, what the condition of that 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 person is living in order to help them and furthermore this is also speaking to educators educators need to look at every single student as an individual and to give a very um uh, what's the individual customized path in their personal development it's not one size fit all and that's sometimes a very big challenge. That's the biggest challenge for any kind of educator. Because if you're in a classroom with 15, 20 kids, you know, of course you're teaching the same thing, but to be able to customize it and how you answer to, you don't answer a question, you answer the person. So if you can give to them exactly what they need, right? Their, their quality, their, their needs to be met and customize. When you can do that, what's going to happen, by the way? When you can customize and you can be sensitive as a leader to the condition of the person, right? And as a judge, you're not going on your first assumption. What will that lead to? Growth. To? To what? Growth and learning. A wealth and learning. But you know what's going to lead to? Many students the next point it's going to lead to many students people are going to flock to you because you're you're not you know first first impression you're not you're taking into consideration the condition of of what that person has got to deal with right and um and and, and appreciating their shortcomings you're going to be able to um to to give them a, a developed to customize a path that's special for them that's going to be naturally bring you many students the second point so we see how the first ties into the second is that clear that's beautiful at least i see that it's beautiful <laughs> it is <laughs> Um, 
And now, even to go a step further, it's even in the very words themselves. I asked the question, why does it say do to raise up? Because a true teacher is an individual. Uh, I tried it, and it's hard on the, um, by the way, it's very difficult to do this in this medium, right? When you're not face-to-face -face dealing with somebody, but you are uh, on Zoom, you know, uh, some people are Zoomed out, <laughs> or you're on Clubhouse or Facebook. It's not so easy to do all of what we just spoke about, As, and especially to raise up a student, like raising, they're a flame, they're a flame, they're a delicate flame. And just like when you light a Shabbos candles, you know, you, you leave the, the match there until the flame is rising on its own. So that's what you got to do for the student, to help build them up that they can stand on their own two feet, because you need to be a recipient in order that you can then do what? Give. Pass it on. Remember, that was Kibel Masoira, Masruha, right? Receive in order to give, to pass it on. So you need to be able to stand up on your own two feet. So you need to be able to teach that way. You need to be able to lead that way. Um, and, and that's, you know, and that's also in the word Talmidim, the word Talmud is not, you know, it's not like a university student who just, you know, just uh, whatever takes in information. The word Talmud means a disciple who's devoted to their mentor, to their teacher um, in, in, in such a manner that they are given over. That way they are able to pass it on. Again, borrowing from those two words and showing it how it is in the very words themselves. Okay, let's go now to, um, to having the many, oh, sorry, the many students then, that that's what will, will happen. There was a debate amongst the sages in the Jewish people. The house of Shammai said, take only the best. The house of Hillel said, no, everybody. House of Shammai, I, I'm not going to go off on this because this is a lot just to, to discuss over here. Their, their souls were rooted on the left part of the divine order of things, which is Gvura. So they saw some things in, in great judgment. And it wasn't wrong. It's not wrong. There's something correct about it because it's part of the divine order of things, the left side, Gvura, being, you know, strong with, with, you know, judgment, refraining. So they refrained. If you weren't a worthy student, you weren't either wise enough, devoted enough, you know, really giving yourself over. So in their school, no, you couldn't come. The house of Hillel, no, took the other approach. And that's the approach that we're speaking about over here, how it lines up. They took the approach, many students. Why? Because you started off with the patience that you have in your judgment, and therefore that will open you up, that you will have many students, because you're going to look at them differently. Because it won't be the first impression, because you see, you know, if someone comes to yeshiva and he's not wearing, you know, his black hat, <laughs> white shirt. Oh, uh, you know, first impression, uh, he doesn't belong in the yeshiva. That would be, you know, and that might stay with you. And then you're not going to be able to see, yeah, there are shortcomings in this person, but you know what? What's there that we can work with? And how can we develop a, a unique path for this child, for this person? When we have that, then we will automatically come to the many students that are necessary to have, because ultimately, what is the desire? What's the desire? Tradition to be passed on. To who? To every Jew. And ultimately, actually, interesting to note, um, based on the Rambam, based on the Rambam, this is even for non-Jews. 
because we have an obligation as Jews to enlighten and to pass on to them the seven Ohide laws that they need to live their life by. So, you know, it doesn't just remain with uh, just the Jewish people, but it's we're responsible in that manner for the entire world, right? You need more students on Facebook and on Clubhouse, you know, <laughs> so we can receive and pass it on. <laughs> okay, now let's get to the third point because I'm over my time. Oh my gosh, I thought I wouldn't. I finished a long time ago. I'm very slow. My apologies. The last point is make a fence around the Torah, a protective fence around the Torah. What's the idea of a protective fence? So the simple idea the, uh, that, uh, that, based on Maimonides' teachings, is that we need to put a fence around, like we put a garden, because we don't want someone to, to, to step on the garden. So it's a protective, it's a protection. So likewise, when it comes to, um, when, when it comes to things in our lives, we need to put a, a protective fence. So for the idea, for example, the, the sages said, you know, don't, um, don't pick up a saw on Shabbos. Now, there's nothing wrong with picking up a saw on Shabbos, except unless you would start sawing. Sawing is a problem on Shabbos because just you're building, you're not allowed to build on Shabbos. But they say, it's muksa, don't pick it up. You know why? Because it might lead you to there. So it's a fence around the Torah, right? To make sure you stay away from this, no, no, on Shabbos, fine. Um, on human level, what does that mean? Uh, a person might get a little anxious or a little upset, a little angry. So maybe if you know what button pushes that to bring you to being anxious and maybe a little angry, make sure that that put a fence around it, that you don't get there. An example, right? Um, oops, sorry. Um, George, in a, in a moment, let me just finish this thought. And then uh, I see you have something you'd like to share. Um, so putting a fence is adding something in your life. That's what it is. It's adding something. So let's explain this on another on another level. And let's explain in human relationships, right? Um, I know that my wife, my dear wife, um, <laughs> that if we make up uh, to, I'm going to pick her up to go somewhere, this and that. I try, but I don't always do this. This is not confession, but. <laughs> Um, that I, um, if I say 12, uh, you know, we're going to be there one thirty, I should try to get there five minutes early. Cause even if I get on time, you know, you know how it is. People look at their watch, you know, waiting, waiting. So, um, try to anticipate something. Now she never, you know, tells me. She tells me 130, so doesn't say, well, we'll come 125, because then 125 means 120, right? So in other words, you make up something, but you make a fence around it, and you come a little earlier, so you kind of take away the, the anticipation or the anxiety of, you know, waiting. And, you know, people don't like to wait. Um, what does that mean? In other words, there are certain things that you are commanded, or you have feel a duty and obligation to do, and you do the obligation, right? So there's obligations that you have between husband and wife, between, you know, friends and whatever, and you do those duties. But then there are those things that are not said. They're not expressed. And therefore, they're not an obligation. But you go, you go forward that extra step and do that thing. Whatever it is, like me coming five minutes early. <laughs> whenever I, I try <laughs> You know, come come the five minutes early, right? The extra, like anticipating something that is not obligatory or dutiful that I have to do, but understanding where that person is 
at, you know, try to anticipate it and do that which is the unwritten duty and obligation. That's the idea of a fence around the Torah, going the extra step. That's what the rabbis did and the sages. They recognize that we have a relationship with God and they said, you know what, there's going to be things that are, we need to anticipate that could be a challenge and this and that. So let's make that fence. So likewise with our relationship with God, there, there is the extra mile that we go. That's the fence that we create that, right? And other, when you make a fence, what you're doing is you're making a boundary, but you're actually in, you're in widening things. You're, you're adding more, more area. So, you know, you won't get to the essential area, but it's a wider area. You're increasing things, not lessening things. So what's a good disciple? You know, many disciples. Because the disciple takes the teachings of the teacher and adds to it. If the disciple just receives, but doesn't pass the baton on with something that they gave to it, right? The speed that you gave to it in, your, in the relay race, then what'd you give to it? <laughs> you, know, you, you took the baton and you stood there. I received. <laughs> oh, great humility. No, but you, but you gave something. You added something. So the disciple is now taking and adding something to it, adding to the teachings. As we mentioned before, right, when you acquire it and you make it your own and so on, that's part of the idea over here, that you are personalizing it. You are adding something, making the fence that is adding more territory, more area, adding something in the teaching, adding something because now you're passing it on to someone who the mentor didn't reach, but you did because you passed on the baton to someone else. That is the deeper idea. And now the complete connection between the three ideas. When we will be, when we will judge appropriately, as we explained, right? Not first impressions, uh, taking into consideration the condition that, uh, that the person is, conditions the person is dealing with and, and tailor make for what they need. You'll get a lot of students. And from those lot of students, what will happen? What will happen? Those students will stand up, become hemidu, to stand and rise up and to be stand on their own because they've received and now they will be able to carry that baton forward and to give something more than even what they received. Now, in the end, it's, you know, this ties in with the, the last statement in the beginning. The first thing is Moses, humility, Mount Sinai. And last thing is to pass it on to create a, a wider fence that we include more our portion of how we're taking the baton and carrying it forward. But it so we need to know that they're connected. It's connected to Sinai. In other words, if I'm passing on in the relay race, if I'm giving it to the the, the team that's on the next, <laughs> I blew it. I got to give it to someone who's on my on my row, right? I've got to get, otherwise I blew it. So if I'm not true to where I got it from at Sinai, I'm making up my own law now. I'm making up my own fence, you know, that's not halachic, not based on Jewish teachings, not based on Judaism, but based on, hey, I can run amok any way I want. So you're not part of, you're not part of the relay anymore. You went off. The path, you need to be true to where you came from. You're connected. You're carrying it forward. You're bringing it forward. It's passed on, absolutely. But remember where you're coming it from, where it's coming from, and remain true to the original message. That based on humility, it's not about me. It's about me paying it forward. It's about me bringing it forward. It's about me carrying the message for because that's what I'm all about. And with that, George, you had something to share. Can I, I want I got a question to ask. Can sure. it be about the Chabad or does it have to be about the topic that you're discussing? Oh, yeah, for sure. But um, um, I don't mind to carry on in a few moments to do that. Um, um, I need, hold on one second, just give me a moment. 
Um, I just have another responsibility. Okay. Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, so we'll, uh, if you don't mind, we'll uh, to your question. We'll get. I just you know to be fair to everybody here, I want to just um, if anybody has any questions or any comments on this that they should share, and then we'll get to any other topic with great pleasure, George. So anybody, please. Or is well, Rabbi, uh, just just to uh, reiterate um, what you were just saying is uh, just recently for Pesach, I actually uh, one of the Seder nights, I, I had a family, I was leading the Seder and I had a family who they're a Jewish family, but they never uh, really practiced uh, Judaism and they just recently started to connect and uh, it was their first Seder ever. Uh, and wow. with all the teachings that you gave us prior to Passover, they had so many questions. And because of what you taught us, I was able to answer about 85% of the questions. The other 15%, I told them, like you tell us, I'm not sure. Uh, I got to look it up. And I did get back to them on each of uh, the questions that they uh, asked me that I didn't know. Wow. And, uh, it just all relates to what you're saying, how passing it on. And uh, with your teachings, I was able to pass it on. Wow, wow, to, wow. Uh, oh, that's beautiful. Wow, thank you for that. Nachas note. <laughs> that's amazing. Beautiful. Thank you, Richard. It's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Very good. Marcy. Okay. Yes, thank you. Yes, a reset for Clubhouse. So, um, yeah, because people on Clubhouse come in and out. So we're doing Pirkei Avot, Ethics of Jewish Ethics. And uh, this actually will be done um, probably Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays uh, every uh, every week from 12.45 to 1.30-ish, even though we're over uh, what I expected today. Um, but yeah, that, that will be the, the general road, Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, Fridays, uh, and Mondays will also teach, but it'll be a different topic. Um, uh, Monday will probably be Talmud-related uh, issues, and Friday will be probably something for Shabbos, like Parsha, or that kind of thing. Okay, thank you, Marcy, for that. Okay, anybody else? I, I, George, go for it, George. Hello. Um so I've got a question. Um, I'm a Jewish convert to Reform Judaism, and just recently I've expressed an interest in the Chabad, and I have went to one uh, a few days ago, and I'm born from parents that are unmarried, and I don't know if that will be an issue with the Chabad. Born of parents that, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Born, my parents are not married and they're separated. Oh, no, that 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 has no bearing. I mean, you know, for 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 Jewishness, it, that doesn't have bearing. You know, not no, no, not at all. But I read the mitzvahs today, and he said something along that line on one of them. Mitzvah. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. The mitzvahs I read. I am. Um, I read one of them and it was on the lines on like it was like um, someone can't become an Israelite if they're in my situation or something like that. Oh no 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 that, that that's that 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 was um yeah you're probably from Maimonides Rambam teaching you're talking about um and there it's speaking if you come from um, a different. From the Moabites or the Edomites, and today we don't know where anybody comes from, so that those that particular law doesn't ex is uh, of of no um, value, shall we say today? Okay. Okay, thank you. I'm yeah. a bit stressed out about it today. Yeah, no, 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 no it doesn't. Uh, that, that that has no value. But a proper uh, conversion, yeah, that that's important, of course. That's a different issue. Okay, thank you. So it will be a problem if I wanted to convert. 
No, 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 no. It's not a problem if you wanted to. I'm saying you, you, uh, one would need a, a proper conversion according to Jewish law. That's all. That's, yeah, but no, no, it's not a problem. Uh, Yaakov, something to share with us. Shalom, Rabbi. Uh, my name is Yaakov Rada. I'm from Israel, and I'm in Ashtod right now. Um, I have a question about uh, having a funeral on, online because my last, my grandmother died, and we are, our family are thinking of having the Shiva online. What does the Jewish law say about that? Having, have, I'm sorry, I didn't catch. Having Shiva? To have, to have the Shiva online. Like online. That. Oh, okay. Yeah. Online. Yeah. Oh, that's a very good question. Yeah, yeah. she died uh, last night of COVID. Oh. So uh, we, my... think, uh, we think that now we, everyone is careful. So we, we thought that we would have a, a Shiva based online. I don't know if it, if it is possible, though. Because you need to have uh, people treat the, the, the death prayer, you know? Right. So very. So Yaakov is asking that his grandmother um, just passed away. Uh, our condolences um, to you and to the family. And may our soul go from strength to strength. And doing a shiva and uh, doing the, the shiva, the, the, the ritual of, uh, you know, of sitting for seven days and uh, doing it online. So let's uh, let's separate the two ideas over here, and the two ideas are um, those who are mourners that they need to mourn, and then those who need uh, who have the mitzvah to comfort the mourners. So it's two separate things. So those who need to mourn mean they have to follow the laws of mourning, which the laws of mourning are you know sitting on a low stool, uh, not wearing leather shoes, uh, you know, and and various things that you do. Um, as signs of mourning and, and so on. Um, that's so then that can be done by a person individually all by themselves with no one there, you know, because you're just observing the, uh, the, you know, the things that we need to observe in sitting Shiva because sitting Shiva is about your mourning process and your mourning process uh, and essentially it's not about other people, it's just about you and what you're doing and how you're going through it. Now, there's a mitzvah for others to comfort the mourner. That is a mitzvah, it's a big mitzvah. Um, it's not such an easy one because, you know, often I call Montreal the capital of, of Shiva. Here people are very traditional and, and Shiva is like a big thing. Now, yeah, it is a big thing because there are families there with my, my, my grandmother, she came from Ethiopia to Israel. Right. So we have at least 58 people that want to come, you know. <laughs> so, so, so comforting the mourner does not have to be that you come to someone's house. Comforting the mourner could be you, you make a phone call or you go on Zoom. Actually, you know, my my daughter-in-law's uh, mother passed away and uh, she's sitting Shiva in New York. She, she lives here with my son and, and their children in, in Montreal or a suburb in Montreal. And um, they're in New York. So they have a Chabad house and a Chabad community. So they made a, a Zoom that people could come on and be a part of and, uh, and comfort the mourner that way. So it's about comforting the mourner. So if the mourner does not want to have people over because of the situation of COVID, which needs to be respected, then um, then the people who are coming to do the midst of the comfort, you got to comfort them in a way that a person would be comforted. If they're not comforted because you know there's going to be you know hordes of people coming into the home and they, and that's going to make them nervous, then you know that then you're not doing a mitzvah. So do the mitzvah by making the phone call. Or if there's a Zoom, if you can do Zoom, good. But if it's a phone call, you're comforting the mourner. I did that yesterday, as a matter of fact. Yeah, now that you mention it, I have a friend of mine here. I mean, my daughter-in-law, she was here at the beginning, so I did that mitzvah um, of comforting. But um, I, I have a friend here sitting from Montreal, sitting in New York also. I made a phone call. I made a phone call to uh, the whole family, actually. They were sitting in you know, New York and, and Florida. And made and made phone calls and, and it was a mitzvah. So that shiva does not mean 
that you have to have people come over. Um, obviously, you know, it might be the preferred way that's, uh, you know, personal human contact in that way of, you know, in the same room. It's obviously but different than I being on a phone call. Uh, but you fulfill, just, but it's all, it's okay to do it that way. It's not a problem. Yeah. Okay. And I just had the talk and, and so I was thinking like, can you, can you really do see about like, uh, do, uh, do, uh, pull a couple of months because of the reason or is you can only do Shiva one time? The Shiva is only for the seven days, and after the seven days, yeah. you have to get up. But then you have 30 days, you have 11 months of saying Akadish, you have 12 months of the year. You know, uh, uh, we just did a, a course, Journey of the Soul, discussing all this, uh, you know, these ideas. But uh, no, 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 it's, uh, you know, just to follow the guidelines. Um, if you have a Chabad rabbi in your area, maybe he can help you out, or another rabbi, uh, whatever rabbi, or, or someone that knows. And they can help you out, but that is the general principle. Okay. Okay, Uncle. Okay, may you know only of joy. May you only and you and your family have um, things to celebrate in your life. And may her soul go from strength to strength. And she should be a a good to better. She should plead on high for the family for all good things in your life. God bless you. All right, I'm gonna to have to run in a moment. If there is any other question or comment that on what we learned over here, um, by the just to, if anybody would like to follow so they can get the um, various classes that every day there's a 9.30 in the morning class on Tanya. Now there'll be a few days a week this uh, Jewish ethics uh, discussion. And uh, so you can follow if you'd like to, follow me or follow Chabad because it goes through Chabad. Daniel. Uh, and with that, we're going to close up shop. My first question, which you can feel free to ignore, but uh, I got things because somebody in here told me this was awesome. So I missed the very beginning. I was curious if you could contextualize, if you haven't already, um, how should I think about the Fertile vote relative to the um, sort of like the Torah and, and other key books? Excellent question. Excellent question. So, um, so you know, Pirkei Avot is part of the Mishnah, you know, and there's 59 tractates of the Mishnah. Most of them, I mean, 60, and most of them are about do's and don'ts, um, which lead to the Gemara and lead to. I'm so sorry. Just like I'm, I'm a secular guy. Please bear with me. Be patient. The Mishnah is the Talmud, or is that different? Oh, okay. Um, okay, thank you for uh, <laughs> setting no, me straight. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> no, no. So the Mishnah, the Talmud is made up of the Mishnah and the Gemara. The Mishnah is um, okay. is sort of statements of law, and the and the Gemara is the elaboration, is the discussion about it, the back and forth, the argument is in the Gemara. I see, the I two see. together make up the Talmud. Okay, the two together make up the Talmud. So Pirkei Avot is part of the Mishnah, the statements, the statements, so to speak, right? But the difference is that the rest of the Mishnah that goes together with the Gemara making up the Talmud um, is more about laws, the do's and the don'ts. The Pirkei Avot is more the ethical teachings, uh, more about the, the spirit uh, of the law rather than the... Uh, technicality of the law. It's more about beyond the letter of the law than the um, adherence to the letter of the law. So it's more that this. Yeah, it's, it's the more constitution as opposed to all the laws. Um, hmm. I don't know if I would. I don't know if I. I you know, but I don't know if that's a good metaphor. I'm not certain. Maybe. Perfect. I retract that. Then. No, I, I'm not certain because you know what? I don't know well enough American constitution to okay. <laughs> as a Canadian. Oh, I, Sure. Uh, like, what what is the timeline when uh, the Perkei Avot comes about? Like, both in terms of like, what was the oral period that these things come from, and or like, when was it initially written? And like, what what was the context going on that um, led us to, as a people, to um, formalize uh, the Perkei Avot in writing? Excellent question. So, you know, um, in Judaism. 
we have the written word and we have the oral tradition. So the oral tradition is now written, <laughs> right? Uh, originally it was oral, passed down from generation to generation. In the second century, Yehuda Hanasi, Judah the Prince, leader of the Jewish people in Israel at the time, foresaw what the future would be uh, and the difficulties that we would have that if we would not write down the teachings, the future would be that we would lose too much of the tradition, too much of the knowledge and the wisdom, and therefore needed to be written down, not just Pirkei Avot, but all of the um, laws, whether it's torts, torts and damages, whether it's laws of, you know, of, of Shabbat, the laws of, um, of marriage, you know, and so on and so forth. All of these things need to be written down for to make sure that the future would not be lost. So it's part of what, what we call the oral tradition. Yes. When you say second century, do you mean AD or BC? Was this under occupation or before occupation? It was uh, under occupation. Second century. Of, 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 the, of the Romans. Of the Romans, yes. Uh, after the common era, after the common era, after the destruction of the Second Holy Temple in the year sixty nine. I see. So at about a hundred years after that, you know, I see. We're, Jews were still in Jews were still in um, in Israel and you know prospering there. Go ahead, Daniel. But, but, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but we had already had a certain diaspora um, under higher under the Greeks. Now, yes, under the Greeks okay. was before the Common Era. The story of Hanukkah in the year 160 around uh, before the common era that was under the Greeks, but then we were under the Romans for, uh, for, you know, for several centuries. I have one last question. Thank you for your patience. Sure. Um, so like, was it, was it, was, was there something related to sort of the extent of Roman oppression and the desire to sort of stomp out our culture that led us to sort of formalize the writing? Or is it sort of a response to the loss of the tempo and how that sort of changed the way that we had to express our Judaism? All of the above. Yeah, all of the things, you know, there was, you know, the outside influence of the Romans, um, you know, the, their, um, their destructive nature, <laughs> shall we say. There was the inside problem of the Jewish people and the waning in the fact that, you know, there isn't a holy temple and, you know, not in, we're not in sort of in, in control of our destiny, so to speak. So, yeah, it's all of those things. Thank you so much. This was really interesting and I, I learned a lot. I had a lot of fun. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for joining. All right, folks, we're going to call it a day. <laughs> More than a day. <laughs> Baruch Hashem. Wonderful. We will continue tomorrow at uh, 1 o'clock with Rabbi Mendy on the Parsha. I will be at 145 doing some uh, in-depth uh, uh, in uh, understanding of uh, just a very nuanced idea about the sons of Aaron who died on the inauguration day of the Mishkan, of the tabernacle. And uh, the meaning, or not the meaning, but... Uh, uh, a very important message to learn from that in our personal lives. All right, folks, thank you very much for joining. Have a wonderful day. God bless you all.